I do want to introduce to you our keynote speaker. He is Dr. Robert Lefkowitz. He is the James B. P Duke Professor of Medicine at Duke University. He is the first faculty member at Duke to be awarded a Nobel Prize while he was employed on the faculty at Duke. And there have been some very illustrious faculty members at Duke, so this is quite an honor. And this is, you probably won't believe this once you uh, see him and you hear him. He said he's been at Duke for 40 years. I'm not going to presume to tell you any more about him. It kind of uh, wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, I think. Please welcome Dr. Robert Lefkowitz. Well, it's, it's indeed a pleasure and an honor for me to uh, have the opportunity to address you today. Uh, I am, uh, I'm going to give you uh, two different types of talks back to back. Uh, and I myself don't know how long I'll spend on each of them. I'll, I'll sort of find out as you do. Uh, the, first, uh, the first thing I want to talk to you about is a little bit about the, the career path that I followed, which may be of some interest to you. And you can see that I've, I've titled these remarks, A Reluctant Scientist, and soon you'll understand what I meant by that. And then more toward the end of the presentation, uh, I will uh, tell you a little bit about the science that I've done, uh, and then I guess we're going to leave 10, 15 minutes for questions at the end, and we want to wrap up by when? 4.30. Okay. So uh, I was born and raised in the Bronx. Uh, I have lived in North Carolina, uh, in Durham, for 40 years since I joined the faculty here in 73. As you listen to me, you may say, wow, if his New York accent is this bad now, uh, what was it like 40 years ago? Uh, and I think it was even more prominent. Uh, anyway, I was an only child, and I went to public schools uh, throughout my elementary and secondary education. Uh, one of the most uh, formative experiences that I had, and I I'll try to underscore where I think there are, are kind of life lessons in, in perhaps in my story, one of the most important influences on my entire career uh, was my family physician. Uh, in the Bronx, Dr. Joseph Feibusch. He was a practicing general physician, uh, and this in an age when uh, physicians actually made house calls. Uh, and he would come to my house if I had a stomach ache or a fever, uh, do whatever he did, lay on hands, uh, write a prescription in an illegible hand, and uh, wow, that just seemed uh, amazing to me. Uh, and very early on, he became my role model. Uh, it seemed to me that there was really nothing higher one could aspire to uh, than to be a physician. Uh, and I think I liked several things about the idea. One, it seemed, not that I understood much about science in, in grade school, but it seemed like he knew all the scientific stuff. In fact, beyond that, he knew all this stuff, uh, these kinds of things that... Uh, it, general folks, lay people didn't know, and he was able to utilize uh, this knowledge uh, to heal and to relieve suffering and pain, etc. And I got it into my head early on that this was probably uh, the noblest calling that one could have. Uh, it seemed to me much like the priesthood. Uh, and so from, I would say, the third grade on, uh, I never really entertained any other possibility than that I would become a physician, and that became my single-minded uh, career focus. Now, there are several things about that uh, that I think are worth underscoring. One would be the importance of role models, uh, and I think for the adults and teachers in, in the group, I don't need to tell you uh, how central uh, your, uh, the exposure of the students to you uh, really is, because I think for most individuals uh, who go into, certainly into science or medicine, uh, almost everybody uh, will recount uh, the importance of a, 
a scientific mentor or a role model for them. I was pleasantly surprised to learn uh, while I was in Stockholm last year that my former student, Brian Kobilka, uh, with whom I shared the Nobel Prize this past year, uh, that he too, uh, he was a physician as I am, that his uh, most important uh, role model as a child growing up was also his family physician. And yet, as, as you know, we both ultimately gravitated into careers in science. So uh, the first point is the importance of role models. The second is the notion of a calling. Uh, I don't know if you all understand what I mean by a calling, but a calling uh, which is something which we generally associate with the clergy, but it's a special sense uh, experienced at a deep uh, emotional level, not so much even at a cognitive level, uh, that you're supposed to do something, uh, hopefully something of some value or uh, in, in its own, or virtue in its own right. And I would have to say that even as a youngster, I experienced the notion of going into medicine as a calling. Anyway, uh, I stuck with that idea and found myself uh, in my early teens at the Bronx High School of Science. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Bronx High School of Science. Uh, to me, your school uh, is very much patterned after the Bronx High School of Science. It was a public school. Uh, it was not a residential school. It's now 75 years old. Uh, and admission to that school uh, was open to anybody in the city of New York. But you had to take a competitive examination. And to this day, the only criterion for admission to that school uh, and this has become somewhat controversial, I gather, from what I read, uh, was how you scored on this competitive examination. And you had to be in the top, I don't know what, but it was uh, the very highest scores. So I went to the Bronx High School of Science uh, with a lot of very, very smart kids. Uh, and uh, I was in the class of 59. We uh, all, of course, went to college. Almost all of us went to graduate school or medical school. Uh, it was a remarkable experience. We had the opportunity to be amongst the first classes to take AP courses, which I assume you all take, uh, and uh, I took quite a number of those. And when I went off to Columbia College in New York City to get my bachelor's degree, uh, I was awarded 20 credits out of the 120 that you needed to graduate for the coursework I had done in AP courses. Uh, because I had 20 credits and was given advanced placement, I was actually able to graduate from college in three years. And at the time, I was anxious to do that because I just couldn't wait to get to medical school. Uh, and I went to medical school in Columbia, so my education is playing out all in New York City. Uh, I went to Columbia Medical School, a college of physicians and surgeons. And those were some of the happiest days of my educational experience. I had been waiting, as I told you, since probably age eight or 10, uh, to learn how to become a physician and to learn that secret stuff that only doctors know. And here I was, and I was learning it. And I loved every minute of it. Uh, and I did my house staff training in internship and residency at Columbia. Now, I would point out that I had no interest whatsoever at any stage in my career up to then of doing research. It never entered my mind that I would be a scientist. In fact, we had several options uh, to do research while I was in medical school. There were blocks of two and three months that you could spend either doing clinical rotations on the wards or doing research. And on every occasion, I opted for the clinical electives. I had no interest in research whatsoever. Uh, I was very interested in science. I was a chemistry and biochemistry major in college. I found it fascinating. But I wanted to use that scientific knowledge directly at the bedside of sick patients. I was not interested in going into a laboratory uh, as a way of, of contributing uh, to uh, medical progress. Now, where that began to change was in 1968. I graduated from medical school in 66 and did two years of house staff training. But in the late 60s, uh, 
something called the Vietnam War was raging. Uh, and it, this was a very unpopular war. And in something which may seem very, very foreign to you students, we had a draft, a military draft, and we had a separate draft for physicians, a doctor draft. So you had to go into the service. Uh, the only question was whether you would be in the Army or the Navy or the Air Force. And you would spend one of your two years of required service in Vietnam. As I said, it was a very unpopular war, uh, and uh, many of us were not anxious uh, to participate. Uh, there weren't a lot of options uh, to fulfill your military obligation and at the same time not serve in the armed forces. One of the very few was to secure, and it was very competitive to do so, to secure a commission in the United States Public Health Service. The United, Hel United States Public Health Service at the time was considered not just one of the uniformed services, but was considered one of the military services, uh, and they oversaw, for example, the Coast Guard. They also staffed the National Institutes of Health, uh, the CDC, the Center for Commun Communicable Diseases, and several research install installations uh, in the far southwest, which did research on uh, Native uh, American Indian populations. Well, I was able to secure a commission in the Public Health Service and was assigned to the NIH where I began my research career in 1968. And I can tell you it was not pretty. Uh, the uh, first 12 to 18 months of my 24-month uh, assignment there were without any discernible success or forward progress on my project. Uh, I was an utter and abject failure and I think that's another important thing to take away. Uh, if you're going to do scientific research, failure will be your handmaiden. Uh, you will fail uh, much more than you will succeed. I remember one of my mentors uh, saying to me uh, during this dark period, uh, he said, Bob, uh, do you know the difference between uh, a highly successful scientist uh, and one who's not successful? And I said, no. He said, well, for the unsuccessful scientist, uh, maybe 1% of what they're trying to do will work. But for the real superstar, it might be as high as 2 or 2.5%. Two and, uh, and boy, was he right. In fact, I think he was over generous. So you have to learn that if you are going to pursue a career in research, you have to be ready to deal over and over and over with failure. Of course, how you define failure is, is also an issue which we can talk about because uh, if you're shrewd, every failure teaches you something so that you're a little smarter uh, for the next experiment. Well, I was pretty miserable uh, with the research. And since I had always wanted to be a, a physician anyway, a practicing physician, this really sort of steered me away from any nascent interest I might have had in research. And in particular, uh, I had a very personal experience about six months into my time at the NIH. It was Thanksgiving time. Uh, the NIH is in Bethesda, Maryland, the suburb of Washington. And I uh, decided to travel home with my uh, young family uh, to New York City to spend the Thanksgiving holidays with my parents. I was very close to my father. I was an only child. He was an accountant, knew nothing about the specifics of what I did, uh, but had always been a wonderful advisor on all matters. And so I had a long talk with him, and I told him how unhappy I was uh, with my repeated failures during those first six months. And this was a new experience for me. I was always top of my class. I had never failed at anything uh, that I'd ever tried to do. Uh, and here I was meeting with no success whatsoever. Well, you know, for my parents, uh, their dream had always been for their only son uh, to become a physician. Uh, and uh, he, said, he counseled me very reasonably. He said, look, you always wanted to be a doctor, you know, you'll fulfill your military requirement there at the NIH, just get through it, and then you'll go back to your clinical training and go on with your career as a cardiologist. I was already interested in cardiology, uh, just as you had always hoped and planned. Uh, well, that made a lot of sense to me, uh, and I felt very relieved, and I, I traveled back uh, right after the Thanksgiving holidays uh, to the NIH to continue my work and began immediately applying for residencies and fellowships to follow my two-year stint at the NIH. Well, it turned out that was the last time I ever spoke with my dad. Uh, he died suddenly of a heart attack uh, 
uh, two weeks later uh, in mid-December. And that deeply affected me uh, and in several ways. But one of the strangest ones was that I, uh, I almost felt I had made, if you will, a pact with him. We had a plan. I was going to pursue my clinical training, and that's where I would go. Well, things often don't go the, the way you anticipate. And toward the end of my two years at the NIH, things really began uh, to break for me. Uh, and I met with my first successes and published several what turned out in retrospect to be important papers. But by then I had already committed myself uh, to further clinical training in Boston at the Massachusetts General Hospital, which is one of the main teaching hospitals of Harvard. Uh, and even though I was under a lot of pressure to stay at the NIH, uh, I was not going to break my commitment, and so off I went. Uh, and then I had another really important experience. During the first six months back at clinical work, I loved it. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, but of course, I was doing no research. Uh, and the importance of this experience was that I realized just how much I missed the stimulation of being in the laboratory, of having data every day, of being able to grapple with it and analyze it. And I began to realize, you know, this is going to be tough if I spend the rest of my career and I don't have any data anymore. Uh, and so during my second six months uh, of my senior residency, and against hospital regulations, which mandated that although we had six months of elective time, it all had to be spent doing clinical work because we were paid by clinical patient-derived revenues, I basically surreptitiously <clears throat> inveigled myself into the laboratory of a scientist and spent the next six months uh, doing basic research. Uh, they eventually caught me. Uh, one night, the residency director was coming through the halls and found me with a rack of test tubes. Uh, but they just slapped me on the wrist and kind of looked the other way. Uh, I went on to spend two more years there uh, doing research and completing my clinical training in cardiovascular diseases. And then in 1973, uh, I moved to Duke to join the faculty just 40 years ago. When I first came here, uh, my research was beginning, uh, I didn't accomplish all that much during the, surprisingly, during the residency years in, in Boston and research, uh, but it certainly kept my drive alive. And when I came to Duke, uh, I was still kind of undecided as to which way my career was going. Uh, I would say the first year or two, I probably spent 50 or 60 percent of my professional time doing research in a new laboratory that I was setting up and maybe uh, 40 or 50 percent uh, doing clinical work, attending cardiology clinics and making rounds. And by the way, I continued making rounds, uh, teaching rounds, uh, for 30 years, until 10 years ago uh, when I turned 60. Uh, but then, within the first couple of years, things really started to take off. And I got deeper and deeper and deeper into the research. And I found, within about three years, that what I was dreaming about on the way home, in the shower, uh, was not the patients that I saw in clinic. It was my experiments and how I could get them to work, how I could move the projects forward. And so, over a period of time, I began to evolve more and more into a fuller-time scientist. But, you know, I mentioned reluctant scientist. One of the things I realized in retrospect that held me back was, you know, I had this deal with my dad. Uh, I was going to be the cardiologist that the family had always dreamed of. Uh, and here, I just felt this impulse to be in the laboratory, almost like in some way I was being disloyal to his memory. Well, of course, I eventually came to my senses uh, and uh, just allowed it to happen. And the remarkably fortunate thing for me, of course, was that I was feeling a calling again but it was for the second time. Now I felt called to research. And again, I think the lesson in both these experiences that I had is that when it comes to figuring out what you're going to do, you can't figure it out with your head. You've got to figure it out with your heart. you just got to listen to your own inner voice in terms of what is it you want to do? What is it you're good at? Uh, what, what kind of work could you do that actually feels like play. If you can figure that out and just sort of listen, you know, to what you're telling yourself, I, I think you'll 
have a really good chance of being successful. I'm for sure you'll be a lot happier. Uh, so I eventually uh, evolved further and further uh, into a, uh, a very basic or fundamental scientist doing biochemistry and chemistry. My dad never got to see any of it. Uh, I would say 25 years ago I started getting awards for my research. I know he would have been extremely proud of it. My mother was proud, but I don't think she ever fully came to grips with it either. Uh, she would, every time I would talk to her, it seemed, uh, and she called me Bobby, she would say, Bobby, have you figured it out yet? So what she meant is that her notion was that I had basically been, I don't know what the right word is, seduced by some crazy scientific question. And that if I could just figure out the answer, I'd come to my senses and return to a career as a physician. Well, alas, uh, for poor mom, it never happened. Uh, and at the time of her death, of course, uh, I still hadn't quite figured it out. Uh, and, you know, I haven't figured it out yet. Uh, anyway, things have uh, gone well for me uh, in recent years. Uh, I've enjoyed my career to date uh, at Duke uh, quite a bit. Uh, I can, as I mentioned, I continue to uh, function as a, an academic physician, teaching students uh, and, and fellows on the wards until 10 years ago. Now all my teaching is confined to the laboratory where I remain as active as I've always been. I, as you heard, I, I will turn 70 next month, month from today. Uh, and uh, the word retirement doesn't really mean anything to me at this point in my life, uh, and I very much enjoy uh, what I'm doing. It's interesting to me that my co-Nobel laureate, uh, Brian Kobilka, uh, who was my fellow in the mid-'80s, is like myself a physician, uh, and a cardiologist. Uh, he served in my laboratory for four or five years in the 80s uh, as a cardiology fellow doing research, much as I had a generation before uh, up in Boston. Uh, and yet, uh, where it brought us to this research was the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, uh, which has bemused some uh, individuals who uh, think of themselves as real chemists. Uh, People often ask me, uh, were you surprised by winning the Nobel Prize? Uh, and the answer is yes and no. No, I wasn't surprised in the sense that for a number of years, uh, individuals have told me that, you know, hey, Bob, you may win the prize, you're going to win the prize, etc. It didn't happen uh, until last year. Uh, so in that sense, yeah, had it ever entered my mind? Sure. Uh, but would I have ever expected it would be in chemistry and not in medicine? No, uh, at least not until very, very recently. And in particular, on the day that I received the call uh, from Stockholm at 5 a.m. Uh, East Coast time, uh, I was totally shocked because I had heard no inklings, no rumors, nothing to alert me that this might be in the works, much less that it might be in the works uh, in chemistry. Uh, you may or may not know that the uh, Nobel Prizes are announced in a specific sequence each year. Monday is medicine, Tuesday is physics, Wednesday is chemistry, and Thursday and Friday you have economics, literature, etc., and pieces the following Monday. So Monday had come and gone. I certainly hadn't gotten any calls, not that I was expecting one. Uh, Wednesday morning uh, is the chemistry announcement, and you can be sure that I was sleeping very soundly when that call came in for Fortunately, uh, my wife uh, picked up the phone. I would not have heard it. Uh, so, yes, it was surprised, but, you know, in a certain overriding sense, maybe, uh, maybe I thought it might happen someday. And I can assure you this, uh, that the idea that I shared this prize with uh, somebody who had trained in my laboratory, uh, someone whose career I know I had shaped in a fundamental way, and someone with whom I had kept up and continued to advise and talk with over the years was a very, very special treat and one which just sort of amplified the significance of the whole thing uh, in my own mind. So that's how I got here. Uh, that's how I come to be standing in front of you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about why I got the Nobel Prize. Uh, so. I got the prize with Brian for 
elucidating the characteristics of cellular receptors. Uh, so what are receptors for hormones and drugs? Well, uh, I don't know if you can read that, but a receptor, here are some definitions for you, is a molecule on or in a cell with which a drug, hormone, neurotransmitter initially interacts. Ligand, okay? A ligand is a compound which interacts specifically with a receptor. An agonist is a ligand which stimulates a receptor. An antagonist is a ligand which binds to but does not stimulate a receptor. Synonym, a blocker. So if you look at the left panel here in this little animation, here's a receptor. We'll come in a moment more to the idea of why I've drawn it like that. Here's a drug, and it's an agonist. It stimulates something uh, to happen. Here are some examples of agonists, adrenaline or morphine. Both are drugs used in clinical medicine. Here's an antagonist. It binds to the receptor just like the agonist does, but it doesn't do anything. Notice the receptor doesn't change, nothing happens. It just sits there. But because it's sitting there, the agonist can't sit there. That's a block. I guarantee you, there are enough adults sitting in this room that there are people sitting in the room who are taking some form of a blocker, whether it's a beta blocker or something called an angiotensin receptor blocker or others. Antagonists and agonists are used in clinical medicine all the time. So let's give you a sense of how this fits into normal physiology. Because, of course, receptors, like all molecules in our body, evolved to deal with real-life situations, not with synthetic drugs that we make, okay? Uh, so what's the uh, example I can give you of, uh, of how receptors might function physiologically? Well, I have used throughout my career uh, a particular kind of receptor. It's an adrenergic receptor. The term is derived from adrenaline, adrenergic. There's one particular kind of adrenergic receptor called the beta-adrenergic receptor. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and I've used it as a model for most of my work. The beta-adrenergic receptors are the target of a class of drugs called beta-adrenergic receptor blockers, shorthand for which is beta-blockers, okay, which are uh, some of the most highly used drugs in the world for the treatment of coronary artery disease, angina, hypertension, anxiety, a wide variety of things. Now, adrenaline and the adrenergic receptors are crucial in what's generally referred to as the fight or flight response. So, for example, let's say a stimulus, a frightening stimulus is received by the brain. Immediately, a hormone or a neurotransmitter, for example, adrenaline, a synonym is epinephrine, is released into the bloodstream. And that adrenaline molecule, shown right here, binds to a receptor in the plasma membrane, in the outer surface of the cell. And something happens. You get a signal, which goes to the interior of the cell and does stuff and makes the cell do something. If that were a heart cell, it would make it beat faster and stronger. If it was an, a muscle cell in the airways, it would make them dilate. Okay. Uh, we often refer to these molecules that are released into the cell as second messengers, and the first messengers would be the molecules like adrenaline. The adrenaline can't get across the cell membrane, so it stimulates a receptor in the surface of the cell, changes that receptor in some way, and now you get second messengers generated inside the cell. Many years ago, 50 or 60 years ago, a very famous scientist, uh, a pharmacologist named uh, Raymond Alquist, was able to use a variety of drugs that were available, adrenaline and noradrenaline, which are both drugs and hormones and neurotransmitters, as well as several chemically related molecules, to define what he called alpha adrenergic or beta adrenergic receptors. This was simply based on observations 
where if you took maybe half a dozen of these compounds, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and three or four others, and looked at their ability to stimulate things like how fast the heart beats, uh, how much in a tissue bath a, a blood vessel is contracted, the extent to which an isolated preparation of a gland, like a, uh, a parotid gland, a salivary gland, secretes something in response to these drugs. So he looked at the ability of these half a dozen drugs to stimulate these responses. And when he did that, he found that he got one of two patterns. Either, you know, drug one was better than two, is better than three, is better than four, it was the other way around. But it was always one of those two patterns. He said, well, maybe there are two different receptors which have a different specificity. And he called these alpha and beta receptors. Nonetheless, he did that work in 1948 and was rewarded with the uh, Lasker Prize, which is a very uh, prestigious prize in medical research. And uh, nonetheless, the idea of receptors in his day was very different than it is today. Uh, and it was kind of mystical, and it certainly wasn't anything chemical or biochemical. In fact, as late as 1973, now you may recognize that as the year I came to Duke, Alquist wrote the following in a journal. Uh, called Perspectives of Biology and Medicine. And he wrote this after appearing on a symposium program with me in which I presented some of my very, very earliest work. And as you can see, he wasn't all that impressed. Uh, he wrote the following. This would be true if I was so presumptuous as to believe that alpha and beta receptors really did exist. This from the man who came up with the idea in the first place. There are those that think so, and even propose to describe their intimate structure. To me, they're an abstract concept, conceived to explain observed responses of tissues produced by chemicals of various structure. So he didn't really believe in these receptors as real molecules. And in fact, when I came to Duke in 1973, this was the general, shall we say, state of play in the field. There was no real hard evidence that there was such a thing as a receptor. So when I came to Duke and began my research program 40 years ago, I set as my first goal to try to develop a way of directly studying the receptors, of measuring them, characterizing them, so that I could begin to isolate them, prove that they existed, and find out how, you know, what they were and how they functioned. Uh, and so I basically used a very simple approach and those are often the best, in which I would take molecules, and for simplicity I've shown you the adrenaline structure here, and just radioactively label them, and try to see if I could get the molecule to stick to the receptor and actually measure that. I was able to do that, and as a result we were able to do all kinds of things. And one of them uh, was we were able to use these radioactively labeled tags for the receptor to begin the difficult job of trying to isolate them. Now, Receptor isolation was extraordinarily difficult. These receptors, and again, we still hadn't proved that they even existed, are very rare. They're essentially almost trace contaminant proteins in the plasma membrane. So if you took all proteins out of the plasma membrane and laid them out, uh, and you just at random took 100,000 proteins out of a little piece of plasma membrane from a cell, one would be this receptor. 99,999 are other things, sometimes multiple copies of very abundant proteins, but there are almost none of these. Uh, so how are we going to do it? Well, first of all, the, the receptor is stuck in the plasma membrane. I mean, it, it's a solid thing. You can't, like a film, like when you blow uh, the, these thin films of soap uh, that we all used to do. So that you can think of the plasma membrane that way, in which proteins are inserted. So first thing we had to do was solubilize the receptors. Now, this is just an animation. We didn't use magnets. They're not metallic. But the idea is we had to get the receptor out of the plasma membrane in a soluble form. And then once we did that, we had to somehow purify it. This work, not just for the beta receptor, but for other, there were actually at the time were four different subtypes that we thought there might be, alpha and beta, and then subtypes of those, took myself, my students and fellows, 10 years, uh, and it was extraordinarily difficult. And whatever uh, frustration or difficulty I might have thought I experienced back in the NIH for those 
12 or 18 months was nothing compared to this. But we succeeded. And the key to our success was the use of a technique called affinity chromatography. So what we did, and this was painstaking work, we figured out how to take drugs, which would say beta blockers or alpha adrenergic receptor blockers, and we covalently, chemically linked them through various chemistries to solid supports uh, like agarose beads. We then took our solubilized receptor preparations, and again, you, we, we would use detergents, soaps, if you will, uh, and that, just finding one that would work, that is to say would take the receptor out of the membrane and not destroy its characteristics. We would take these soluble receptors and pass them over columns of this material. The receptors would stick to the drugs. So, I mean, that's what they do for a living, right? They bind these drugs. They would stick. We could then wash the columns, wash away everything else, and then elute the receptors back off by putting in a high concentration of another similar drug. So we would call this biospecific adsorption of the molecules to the column and biospecific elution. And we developed different affinity chromatography procedures for each of the several types of receptors. We coupled those with more conventional forms of protein chromatography and were able uh, to ultimately isolate each of the receptor types. As I said, this was 10 to 12 years of work. These are so-called SDS polyacrylamide gels where you can run protein, uh, protein solutions uh, and proteins will separate uh, according to their molecular weights in terms of how far they migrate uh, in the electric field. And as you can see, there's only one protein in each lane. If in the starting material, the lanes would be black. There would be thousands of proteins. We had to obtain approximately a 100 to 300,000 fold purification. And we had bare micrograms of material when we were done. But the material that we had would bind those radioactive ligands that I told you about in just the right way. We could look at the ability of other drugs to compete and knock the radio ligand off the receptor and we would get exactly the right results. So we knew that what we were isolating as a protein had all the characteristics of the receptor. It would bind things in just the right way. The beta receptors would bind beta blockers very tightly, but they wouldn't bind alpha blockers and vice versa. But receptors really do two things. They bind ligands like adrenaline or morphine with a great deal of specificity generally with stereospecificity, and I'm sure you've learned about that in your chemistry and biology courses, that is to say one stereoisomer uh, is much more potent uh, and binds with much higher affinity than the mirror image stereoisomer. And it, there's a remarkable selectivity, which suggests that the binding pocket of that receptor must have very specific uh, geometric constraints. But the second thing that a receptor has to do is do something. As I showed you, it's got to trigger a response in the cell that leads to the generation of some second messenger or something else. And to prove conclusively to the scientific community that we had truly isolated the receptor, we had to show not only that they bound ligands with just the right specificity, but that they could do something. So how are we going to do that? So here's my little magnet cartoon again. So we've got, now we've got the isolated molecule. So now we take a lipid vesicle, sort of like that lipid membrane we talked about, and we reinsert the receptor back into that. So now I've got vesicles with receptor. So now I need a cell, maybe, which doesn't have this receptor. It turned out that was hard to find. Uh, it turns out all mammalian cells have beta adrenergic receptors. But we found the cell in an amphibian, Xenopus lavis. Its erythrocytes have all the enzymatic machinery to respond to beta receptors, but they don't have the receptors. In consequence, this cell doesn't respond to adrenaline. Here it goes. Bounces right off because there's no receptor there to bind it and, and start the ball rolling. Let me just say that while this cartoon is up, G-protein stands for 
uh, GTP binding protein, or guanine nucleotide regulatory protein. This is the next protein in the chain that these receptors activate. So once a receptor binds an agonist and it's doing something, it does that something by interacting with the G protein, which is sort of a middleman, and that then interacts with an enzyme that makes a second messenger. You may have heard of cyclic AMP uh, <clears throat> in your biology classes, which is a second messenger, and there are others. So this cell, this erythrocyte from Xenopus labus, has some kind of receptors. It doesn't have a beta receptor. And it has these G proteins and the other machinery. But it, it can't interact with the adrenaline because there's no receptor. So then we took our lipid vesicles uh, that are containing these receptors, and we used polyethylene glycol to fuse it to the membrane of the cell, thus inserting, reinserting these isolated receptor molecules into the cell membrane. Okay? And we could show, using our radioligand binding techniques, that this is what we had achieved. Now, bingo, the cells responded, which we could measure, to adrenaline. So we had proved once and for all that the isolated single type of molecule that we had was truly the receptor. It bound ligands with all the right characteristics, and it conveyed on a receptorless cell the ability to respond to adrenaline. And this was really then the true uh, proof that the receptors existed. Now, we were then able to, over the, we had reached that point by the mid-1980s. As I said, there was about 12 years of work. The next step was to find out what they looked like. And this, by, by the mid-'80s, molecular cloning techniques, which I'm sure you've been learning about, had been developed. And since we had isolated, frankly, no more than about 25 to 50 micrograms of any of these receptors, we were able to use a variety of techniques, enzymatic and chemical, to chop the receptor up into little pieces, to isolate those peptide fragments on chromatographic columns and use microsequencing techniques, which were just being developed, to find out little stretches of sequence, of amino acid sequence of the receptor. We could then use those and the knowledge of the genetic code to design oligonucleotide probes, which we could then use to clone the gene and the cDNA. I'm sure you've learned, hopefully, a little bit about these techniques. Uh, so that we could deduce the entire amino acid sequence of the receptor. And when we did that, uh, we made a remarkable discovery. So first of all, the receptor, and this is the sequence uh, of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, which we've been working with. Each of those little balls is an amino acid. Uh, there are about 420 of them in this particular protein. There's a letter from the single letter code in each of those uh, saying what amino acid is. You can't see them, it doesn't matter. We could tell from the deduced sequence that there were seven recurring stretches of very hydrophobic amino acids. That generally of about 25 residues in length. This generally indicates a transmembrane spanning domain that's inserted in the lipid bilayer. So here's one, here's one here. And there are seven. So we often call this a seven transmembrane receptor because it has seven transmembrane segments. What was most remarkable in this discovery is that the residues shown in blue were identical to another protein that had been sequenced only a year or two before. And that protein was rhodopsin, the visual pigment that we use to perceive photons of light. Now, it was known at the time that rhodopsin, once it is triggered by a photon of light, stimulates a G protein and leads to second messenger changes. So that's analogous with what I'm telling you. But nobody dreamed that rhodopsin would look like the beta adrenergic receptor or anything like it. So immediately, we perceived that perhaps, and it also had seven membrane spans. We immediately said, oh my goodness, there were lots of other receptors known that were G-protein coupled. Uh, the list is very, very long. Dopamine, serotonin, uh, glucagon, it goes on and on. And we said, wow, maybe all of them look like this. Maybe there's a family 
of these seven transmembrane receptors, and they're all, if you will, siblings. And in fact, very quickly, we were able to clone the genes for these other ones that we had purified. The very next one was something called the alpha-2. Very quickly, we cloned four, and then eight different receptors. They all looked like this. Then others, using our sequences, and assuming that all the receptors would have at least some similarity in their sequences, started cloning other receptors. And very quickly, the family uh, grew uh, until, by the 90s, we knew that there were uh, about a thousand different genes in this gene family, encoding receptors for all manner of things. All of them have these seven transmembrane spanning sequences. All of them share very significant sequence similarity in their amino acid sequences. This slide's a bit old. Of the 800 to 1,000 receptors of this type, different type, 200 are functionally known receptors. By that I mean I can tell you it's a glucagon receptor or a serotonin receptor. But the majority are what we call orphans. So we know it's a receptor from its gene. Remember, the human genome has been sequenced, so we know the sequence of every gene. There are genes that encode things that look like this, and they're expressed in certain cells, but nobody knows what, what the ligand is. These represent an extraordinary opportunity for drug discovery uh, at the present time. Then we know that there are hundreds of sensory receptors. So of our senses, Three of them are carried out by molecules that look just like this. Rhodopsin for vision, essentially it's a photon receptor, smell, and taste. Smell is the largest subfamily. There are probably in the human genome 300 or 400, about half of all the receptors are smell receptors, accounting for why smell is such a, a nuanced thing. Of the various taste modalities, two work through these receptors, bitter and sweet. So the family is generally referred to as G-protein coupled receptors or as seven transmembrane receptors. Of great importance is that, uh, as it says on this slide, more than half of all prescription drug sales in the world today are of drugs which target these receptors directly or indirectly as either agonists, that would be true for, say, uh, adrenaline or morphine, something like that, uh, dopamine, or as antagonists, beta blockers, angiotensin receptor blockers, antihistamines of any kind. There are two types of histamine receptors. They look just like this. They're members of this family. H1 receptors. You know, those are the classic uh, antihistamines that you take uh, when you have an allergy attack. In my day, you know, it's pyrobenzamine. Uh, today, it's uh, whatever you take. Uh, there are uh, lots of them. Uh, H2 is a different type of histamine receptor. It blocks acid production uh, in the stomach, and blockers of those uh, types of histamine receptors are, of course, uh, sold over the counter now for the treatment of gastric hypersity. So it goes on and on. And then, of course, all the opiates, uh, it's morphine, uh, all the different uh, opiates that are used for pain relief, and many, many others. So the family is of extreme importance. And the types of techniques that I've been describing to you uh, have been very, very useful and were adapted as we were developing them in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and were rapidly uh, leveraged by the pharmaceutical industry to very quickly be able to develop new drugs uh, for, uh, for patients to take. In the last few minutes, I want to tell you about one other aspect of the research, and that has to do uh, with a phenomenon which is not just pervasive, but is universal amongst all of these receptor-mediated systems. It's called desensitization. And it refers to the phenomenon shown here for two different receptors, the beta-adrenergic receptor and the angiotensin receptor. And it's simply that when you stimulate them, either adrenaline here or angiotensin, angiotensin, as I'm sure some of you know, is an 
adrenal hormone from the adrenal cortex. It constricts vascular smooth muscle, raises blood pressure. Blockers are used to treat high blood pressure. But when you stimulate the receptors, you get a signal. In this case, it's a second messenger cyclic AMP. In this case, it's a different second messenger called diacylglycerol. But very quickly, within seconds, even in the presence, continued presence of the stimulus, you get desensitization. You lose the signal. Things shut down. And in the case of agonists, that's a very significant uh, break on their therapeutic efficacy. So I've always been interested in, in how that happens. And in fact, uh, over the years, we discovered the basic biochemical mechanism of that. Turns out when you stimulate these receptors with an agonist, as I told you, they interact with these G proteins, you get second messengers and all kinds of sigma. But very quickly, you also get desensitization. And the desensitization is carried out by proteins from two other gene families, two families of proteins that we discovered uh, in the 80s and 90s. One is a family of kinases. You may have learned that a kinase is an enzyme which transfers a phosphate group from ATP to a substrate. In this case, the substrate is the receptor, but even more specifically, the activated receptor. Uh, so GRK stands for G-protein coupled receptor kinase. There are seven enzymes, this one is GRK2, phosphorylates the receptor, usually on multiple sites on this carboxy terminal tail in the cytoplasm. And this leads to the binding of a second type of protein, which we discovered, called beta arrestin, so named because it arrests or stops signaling. When the arrestin binds, and the trigger for its binding, are the it likes to bind to the phosphates. So once the activated receptor is recognized by the kinase, it's phosphorylated, the beta arrestin binds, and then uh, that really blocks the G protein from getting in there. And so you have desensitization. So just in cartoon form, here's the agonist. The receptor changes shape on the inside. Here's the G protein being activated. Whoops, here comes the GRK. It puts those phosphates on. That's actually what Perestin looks like. That's its crystal structure, and now it's in the way. So you have desensitization. Now, over the last 10 years, what my work has focused on is shown in this slide. We made the very surprising discovery that this system of a GRK and Berestin, which we had discovered over a period of many years as the mechanism which turns off G protein signaling, we found out that it actually can itself serve as a signaling system in parallel to the G protein. In other words, it gives the receptors a different way to signal. This is a total surprise. Uh, and so really, this system is, if you will, bifunctional. On the one hand, it desensitizes the G protein signal. But on the other hand, it sets up an entirely different way to signal to the inside of the cell. And I won't go into, it's very complicated how that works, uh, but it's fascinating. So, closing thoughts. Uh, I've had a magnificent time with these magnificent seven uh, transmembrane receptors. Uh, and even when you're doing very basic science, as I've been doing, fundamental biochemistry, we're now doing x-ray crystallography, you can still generate new ideas for clinical medicine. Uh, and that, for me, has been one of the most gratifying uh, parts of, uh, of the kind of career that I've had, having been originally trained as a physician. And I would tell you that you're only the second high school audience that I have spoken to since I won the Nobel Prize. The first one was when I was in Stockholm. I was invited to uh, address a group much like this, uh, not quite as large, in one of the leading high schools in Stockholm. And, you know, they have posters, uh, which I guess you can order. Uh, they're very lovely uh, in each of the scientific areas. And so I was at, so we have a couple in my lab, uh, and I say I'm sure you can order them uh, from the Nobel Foundation. They print up many of these. Uh, and so the students had the poster for the chemistry prize. And so I was doing a signing. I was standing off to the side after my lecture, signing their posters. And one young lady uh, comes up to me, 
And then some guys come up, they wanted me to sign their arm. I said, well, okay, I'll sign their arm. But then this young lady comes up to me. Uh, well, this, look at here. <laughs> she asked me to sign her forehead. Uh, and uh, that was an unusual request. I'm sorry I didn't get her name, because I'd like to know if she's washed that off yet. Uh, <laughs> because it was only a few months ago. The, the other thing is, I would remind you is that in this day and age, you don't do all this research and win a Nobel Prize standing by yourself at a lab bench working all alone. Uh, the work is done by a lot of people. This is a picture taken uh, 10 years ago uh, at my 60th birthday when a bunch of my alumni returned. I had uh, have trained over 200 people in my laboratory in my career. Well, we had about a hundred of them back at this time. Uh, and this guy here, by the way, is Kobilka, who shared the prize with me. Uh, they, uh, so we were taking a photograph. I had been standing right here. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they hoisted me up. Uh, but I like the picture because it gives credit where the credit is, is done to these people. Uh, I always tell people, nothing is impossible for the man who doesn't have to do it for himself. Uh, and <laughs> in fact, they deserve the credit. And their hoisting me up like this is, is in a sense, very uh, emblematic of what the whole thing is about. And then the final thing I'll just put on here, if I can find it. Uh, <laughs> Absent this, with all due respect, I suspect I would not have been invited here to see you. But in case, if you've ever wondered, well, what's it like when you receive the Nobel Prize? What goes on there? Uh, it happens in a, uh, an amazing concert hall, even more balconies than you've got here. Uh, and that's me and Kobilka, uh, in white tie and tails, I would point out. Uh, and this is a member of the Nobel Prize Committee in Chemistry. Uh, this is Jim Watson. Anybody know that name, Watson and Crick? It's the 50th anniversary, it turns out, of his prize uh, for the double helix. And he was back, and there he is. Uh, and here's my big moment. Uh, the king and queen, behind them, the lovely young princesses. Uh, and he uh, hands me the medal. And now, they rehearsed us in the morning. Uh, I got a bow three times, once to the king, once to your colleagues, once to the audience. And this is my lovely wife, Lynn, who seems very proud. And that was my grandson next to her. So thank you very much.